Good evening. I'm Caroline Brick, and I serve as Executive Director of Tikva's Jewish Parents Forum, the convener of tonight's conversation. On behalf of the thousands of parents in our JPF community, I'd like to express my deep gratitude to Joe Lonsdale and Pano Kanalos, founders of the University of Austin and our gracious host this evening. It's a real privilege to hear from you both, along with Tikva's leader, Eric Cohen. At Tikva, we've been educating and emboldening Jewish college students for many years. And so we're not surprised by the university crisis now unfolding on campuses across America. The university problem, including the mistreatment of Jewish students and the radical hatred of Israel, is not new, even if the intensity and severity is worse than before. But we are alarmed nonetheless. And our aim tonight is to make sense of what is happening and, more importantly, to articulate a strategic response. Now is the moment to act and a time to build. I will leave it to our panel to delve more deeply into that subject. But let me simply share an interesting data point. As part of the online registration for this event, we asked our Jewish parents a few simple questions. Where did you go to college? Would you send your children to your alma mater? And if you could send your children to any university in America, where would you send them? Of the many hundreds of parents who responded, a clear majority said they would not feel comfortable sending their children to their alma mater. And in terms of parents' top choice schools today, there emerged three clear winners. Number one, Yeshiva University, a strong Jewish and Zionist institution. Two, Hillsdale College, a strong American institution that believes in Judeo-Christian values and the goodness of Western civilization. And three, the University of Florida, led by former Senator Ben Sass, who stands tall among all university presidents for his moral clarity and civic courage in the face of the current assault on Jews in Israel. I'm sure after tonight, the University of Austin will soon join the list. <laughs> For many years, American Jews looked to university education and often to a small number of the so-called elite universities as the gateway to the American dream. Yet this moment has illuminated a new and grim reality. That while name brand schools may have prestige, they often lack moral clarity and true excellence. The sick tolerance and even celebration of Jew hatred is just a symptom of this larger disease. The crisis is real, not only for Jews, but for all Americans committed to preserving and perpetuating the best of Western civilization. In 2021, Tikva founded the Jewish Parents Forum to strengthen parents interested in raising committed Jews, proud Zionists, and patriotic Americans. We saw the problems in our schools and colleges, and we wanted to arm parents with the moral and intellectual confidence to pass down these sacred values within their homes, to defend them within their local institutions, and to build new institutions when necessary. Thankfully, there are visionary and courageous Americans who have indeed risen to the moment. We are honored to hear from Joe Lonsdale and Pano Kanalos founders of the University of Austin, and from Eric Cohen, the CEO of Tikva, an organization that educates thousands of students a year from middle school through graduate school. No set of questions is more pressing. How should Jewish parents think about college? What are the best options? Is there any hope of reform? Or is now a time to build? We look forward to exploring these questions together this evening. And with that, I'm delighted to turn it over to Sean Clifford, Tikva's Chief Strategy Officer, to moderate the discussion. Hey, y'all. Thank you so much for showing up tonight. This event, incidentally, was planned months ago. And I think in light of everything that's happened over the past uh, four weeks, it's more timely than ever. So very grateful that you would spend some time with us tonight. Uh, to really explore the state of higher education and what we might do about it. 
This is also timely because today is the very first day that the University of Austin has opened up the doors to accept applications to students. And so, very exciting moment. So, we've got a great panel tonight. I can't do justice to their bios, but let me briefly set the stage uh, so that they have some context when they speak. Uh, First, on my left, we have Joe Lonsdale, amazing jacket. Uh, Joe, Joe's a tech visionary. He is the co-founder of Palantir. He's the founder and managing partner of 8VC, uh, headquartered here in Austin. And he's also the founder of the University of Austin, along with Pano. And Joe, oftentimes when people think of you, they think of tech. I think of you as someone who embodies the frontier spirit. You've written about that. And on the frontier, you have to build. And you have to build new things. And so we're grateful that you are applying some of that expertise developed in the venture and tech world into building something new in the university. Uh, then we have Pano Canelos, PhD in the University of Chicago. He was the 24th president of St. John's College, one of my alma maters, um, and now is the founding president of the University of Austin. Oftentimes we'll read about the contemplative life and the action-oriented life. Pano is one of the rare few that can combine the two together in a powerful way. And then we have uh, the privilege of having Eric Cohen, who is the CEO of Tikva. Eric launched his career with Irving Kristol at the Public Interest, uh, spent time at the White House with Leon Cass, and has spent much of the past 15 years dedicating himself to advancing Jewish excellence and Jewish flourishing as the CEO of Tikva. So three very uh, excellent panelists, three very distinct perspectives. Tonight, we're going to explore four key themes. The first is the crisis of the university. What's happening? How we got here? Uh, what led us to this dramatic moment where we're kind of surprised at these institutions that we've known for so long. Second, we're going to look at the Jewish experience in this and explore how it's unique. Third, we're going to talk about the purpose of the university uh, and also incorporate a few questions on free speech. And then lastly, because this is Texas and we are ever optimistic, ever oriented towards building better things, we're going to talk about the future, renewal, and what we might build that actually suits this moment. So with that, I'd like to open it up. This is a question, actually, for all three of our panelists. Many people were surprised by what they've seen on campus over the past four weeks. I have to venture that none of you are surprised. Alarmed, perhaps, but not surprised. All three of you individually have taken significant efforts over the last few years to try and address uh, some of the big problems that have been surfaced over the last month. What is it that you saw? over the last few years that prompted you to take action in a uh, significant manner that many other people are just waking up to now? Should I start? Great. Uh, can you hear me OK? Great. Thanks. Um, well, thank you, first of all, for, for having me here this evening and, and hosting this event. Um, there is simply no more important thing to talk about today than what's happening in our world and the role that higher education has in that. Um, I, I'm going to start at the cosmic level, if I could, and then get bring it down to how we saw what was coming when we started this project two years ago at the University of Austin. We are at a moment of civilizational crisis. We are at a, a turning point in our own civilization, the civilization that for thousands of years has been nurturing us in the West. A civilization is a collection of people who together seek what is good, what is true, and what is beautiful. In the course of doing that, we create things, we build things, we create communities, we create institutions of learning. The antithesis of civilization is barbarism. What do barbarians do? They tear things down. They destroy. They mangle. They mutilate. Civilization stands for life. Barbarism is nihilism. It stands for death. We are at a moment when the barbarians are ascendant. And the only thing to do when everything is being torn apart is to build anew, to create. Those of us in higher education, or I should say, I spent my whole career in higher education, those of us who have been behind enemy lines for quite a while, 
All right, have been watching the decay of these institutions, especially the prestigious institutions, for decades. It wasn't pretty on the inside, but we knew that what was happening inside universities would eventually be happening outside in the culture. So a couple years ago, Joe and I and Barry Weiss, Neil Ferguson, Arthur Brooks, we met here, actually, on Joe's patio. And we determined that it was a time to build and to create, that that was going to be our bulwark against the oncoming barbarism. Two years later, now that we're launching this university, I think we've realized that our instincts were right. So I'll turn it over to Joe or Eric. Look, I think if you want to understand the crisis of the universities, it's helpful to understand what a college should do at its best. And I think what a college should do at its best is, is three things. One, it's got to help young people think about the big questions of human life. Love and death, justice and injustice, uh, the meaning of family, all these big, enduring human challenges that we face. And to think clearly about those things, it helps a lot if you're a part of a civilization that has a lot of inherited wisdom that can help you make sense of those questions. So the first thing a great college should do aided by the best that's been thought and said, and aided by the accumulative wisdom of tradition. And we happen to be a part of Western civilization, a civilization that the Jews had a very big role in giving birth to, should be to mine that wisdom to help young people think about their lives. I think the second thing a great college should do is to help citizens and ultimately statesmen think about the big challenges of their era. Now, studying history helps a lot, but you also got to be able to make sense of the world as it is today, the economy society, war and peace, strategy, a great college should have the resources to prepare leaders of a civilization. And third, a great college should have models of excellence, just impressive people that young students are around. Now, there are many great college professors, but I'm not sure college professors are the only models of human excellence that young people should be around. And I think the crisis of our universities is they gave up on all three of these elevated purposes. And when you give up on elevated purposes, you fill the vacuum with debased purposes. And so the crisis of our universities, if you want to boil it down to its simplest form, is there's this sick paradigm that you can explain all of life between the oppressors and the oppressed, and the oppressed class have to band together to liberate themselves from the oppressors. And that's it. Now, there are many impressive people at our universities, and there's a great professor here, and there's a great scientist there, and there's a great historian teaching one class in a basement somewhere. But the overall culture of most of our universities has been eroded, and that's the crisis. And when that culture is eroded, you see the madness unfolding before our eyes. I agree with what both of them said. This is a crisis for our civilization. The universities have eroded. You know, I think the universities have gotten a lot worse in just the last decade. You can really you can really map it, interestingly, to the ascendance of the philosophy that kind of came out of a lot of this stuff. You have to remember now, these people, you know, they really believe in this Foucault, Derrida, postmodern, oppressor-oppressed framework. And what that framework tells you is that all the principles we hold here, the built Western civilization that went in positive some ways together, those are fake things we created for power games. And all there really is is power. Like, that's what the philosophy is. It's very simple. That means these people think about power very carefully because that's what they believe actually matters. So it's not just, you can't just replace a president of a university, right? You're not just gonna fix it. These people have been thinking about this power game for decades. They've conquered the departments which each run themselves, they've conquered the administration, and they've conquered thoroughly, and rotted thoroughly these organizations. And you saw them starting to put out a lot of these kind of ideologies, unfortunately, through something that sounded very good 10 years ago, which was the DEI, social justice warrior kind of framework. And it's fascinating, if you look at the effect on, you, know, you can measure it in different ways in our society, but you measure the, the Democratic Party support of Israel, which I think this crowd might care a little bit about, it was about a positive 35% in about 2013. It's negative 5% today overall in terms of the average person in the party. And so, so basically it's gone down steadily the last 10 years. And what's happened is they apply these frameworks to everything. And these, if you look at these DEI groups, they're, they're rabidly anti-Israel because it's, it's, their framework says that that's, they should be that way. It doesn't matter what the logic, it doesn't matter what's right or wrong. What matters is, the, is, the, is their framework and it says it's bad. And so you kind of, you've kind of seen these schools just go insane the last 10 years as these people kind of came out of the woodworks and just took them over entirely. 
And it, it's really, if you haven't been on campus, you, you, maybe you've missed it, but it's, it's something that is just very clearly needs a response, and it's not going to happen without just magically replacing a few presidents, and all of a sudden these things are better. Could, could I just follow up on the power issue here? Because um, I think it's, it shows the importance of having institutions, both secular and sacred, that are committed to the pursuit of truth. Because fundamentally, those who say that all human relationships are simply relationships of power are wrong. That's false. We know that. We know that not every single relationship is about domination and submission. There's a huge matrix of human relations. Sometimes two people can actually work together to, for mutual benefit. Sometimes two people could tear each other down. And sometimes when we have the best of the human spirit evident, people will sacrifice themselves for others. So to say that human reality can be reduced to a simple binary power matrix is not simply destructive, it's untrue. And that's why when universities have given up on the pursuit of truth, they give up on understanding the reality of the human experience and we, find, and we face disaster. When we first started the University of Austin two years ago, actually two years ago, this very day, November 8th, we made an announcement. Uh, we published a piece on Barry Weiss's Substack, and we said, we're building a university dedicated to the fearless pursuit of truth. Twitter exploded, right? We were the number one news story in the world for 48 hours, for two days. So many people were saying, what are you talking about truth? Nobody believes in truth anymore. What's this truth thing? Who are you guys to say the truth is? I mean, it was obscene, the response that we got from so many quarters. 10 times as many people said, thank God somebody's actually saying something about what universities should stand for. So I, I think we have to be completely committed to truth if we're gonna understand the world and make the world what it should be. Eric, when you think about the death of the university, at least as we've conceived of it, was it murder or suicide? <laughs> Assisted suicide. Uh, yeah, right. Assisted suicide. That's <laughs> you know, I, I, I think there's a tension in even a great university focused on truth between transmission and freedom or between the spirit of tradition trying to pass down an inheritance and the spirit of inquiry, the spirit of the frontier trying to found things. Um, and in a funny way, the university sort of gave up on both. They abandoned the idea that there were any truths that we could learn from the past, that the great inheritance of the Hebrew Bible or Plato's Republic or Aristotle's yeah. ethics um, or Shakespeare's Hamlet, they decided, well, these are just old books written by oppressive people uh, propping up a society that we're happy to be liberated from. And so they abandoned the wisdom of tradition. But the truth is, the irony is they think they're so radical, it's all so boring. I mean, that's the great irony is that the, the, the dominant culture of the university is a lot of fancy words saying a lot of simple untruths. And they've abandoned the creativity of the pursuit of truth, the beauty of the pursuit of truth, the complexity of the human experience and the effort to try to understand it. They abandoned that, and the people that abandoned it then, as Joe said, figured out how to do a run through the institutions, take over departments, and then perpetuate their own pettiness, and that's what they've done. Um, and and so, uh, and by the way, all at a nice price tag of three, four hundred thousand dollars a year for the most elite prize. And. They've, they've been able to do this because they've trafficked for way too long on inherited prestige. Medieval culture of buildings and you know medieval logos and all this stuff. And they haven't given all that up because that aura of prestige has allowed them to perpetuate this. And I think maybe now is a kind of shocking mugging by reality that might open us up to the fact that the emperor has ripped clothes, we'll put it that way. We probably could dedicate multiple hours to all the issues that are afflicting universities. Uh, with hopes of covering the full agenda, I'd like to transition now to the experience for the Jews. Joe, uh, the American university once served as this great bastion of meritocracy, where those, irrespective of where they came from, their wealth, uh, 
were able to kind of rise up. And if they could think and study, uh, it was an opportunity to vault them into professional and social success. This opened up a lot of doors for Jewish Americans. I think a lot of people would say that the universities no longer feel like bastions of meritocracy today. What happened? Well, I mean, it's very ironic, right? Because a lot of my family in the 1920s and 30s was excluded for being Jewish from a lot of top colleges. That was actually how things worked here in America. And uh, now that's starting to happen again. And if you're, if you're white or Jewish, you're actually less likely, or Asian, of course, less likely to get ahead in these places. So if anything, apparently this has been the norm. And there was like a very strange interregnum where you know, Harvard actually switched to using the SAT and, and they switched to doing things based on meritocracy for real. Uh, just for this for this period that that's, that's, this seemed like it was just the future and just like how things were going to work and now it's very strangely gone away. Um, you know, it's 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 pretty it's it's pretty clear what happened is that people you know people no longer believe in founding values of our country. They no longer believe in in markets. They no longer believe in meritocracy. They no longer believe in the best ideas winning because uh, when the best ideas win, it's not their ideas and so they're so they're setting a table against it. And uh, you know uh, that way of running society. Is is gonna is gonna you know it breaks things. I, I I think it's very related just to in terms of what happened. I think you have to like see what else is going on in society and realize it's the same thing is happening in the universities. You know what is going on in our inner cities right now? What is going on? Why do we have all these crises of our of how broken it is, how dangerous it is all of a sudden in our cities again? How, how we have these messes that going on where people are you know homeless deaths are skyrocketing, drug trafficking, sex trafficking skyrocketing. It's the same thing when you have people in charge who no longer care about the best ideas winning. Instead, they care about their, their ideas of equity, their ideas of what they call social justice. These are all these are all basically kind of non-meritocratic philosophies that are flawed philosophies that are not how our civilization works and they're not how any good civilization works. And you know, they sounded good, they felt good, and we let them get away with it. I think a lot of people, frankly, in the Jewish community, unfortunately, are partly partly to blame for going along with this stuff because it felt good and it seemed nice. And and now that's now that this illiberal thing has created the monster and now it's going after the Jews. And so hopefully we can wake up and stop feeding this nonsense. Pano, there's an expression that the Jews often are the canary in the coal mine. And when you look at the events from the past month, it would seem that there's a lot of uh, pent up animosity directed at the Jews. In your time in academia, is there something distinctive about the Jewish experience uh, that, or distinctive about the cultural forces that are now ascendant on campus that results in heightened animosity somewhat uh, uniquely directed against the Jews? Universities have become places that honor, let's say, the inversion of what is good, um, that are dedicated to trying to, um, dedicated to trying to replace accomplishment, merit, the, the, the wonderful things that are, are legacy inheritances, the things that Eric was talking about, with um, something, something emotional, something uh, intangible, all towards, and what I would say is a kind of utopian, amoralistic end, right? So universities have become dominated by people who's, who believe that the end of history is about creating a perfect utopian civilization. And that anything that gets in the way of that needs to be destroyed. Well, it's hard to create a utopian perfect civilization when you come face to face with very successful, organic, historic civilizations. Everything that the Jews represent is anathema to people who want to tear the world down to create it anew. And so I think the Jews in particular bear a kind of hostility from those who cannot abide by what's been inherited, cannot abide by legacy. And, and you know, it is the canary in the coal mine. I mean, the same animosity that is directed towards Jews will spread and be directed towards everybody and anyone who wants to hold on to things that have been held to be good, true, and beautiful over time. And that's why we have no choice but to stand on the front lines right now, those of us who aren't Jewish, with our Jewish brothers and sisters. And we have no choice. This is a moment where we are, as I said, a civilizational moment where we have to hold back the tide that's been rising 
Look, over the past few weeks, we've seen Jewish students at Cooper Union locked up in a library where people are banging outside calling for their destruction. We've seen mass rallies at every major university calling for the annihilation of the Jewish state. We've seen professors at Cornell screaming in exhilaration at the wonder of the Hamas terror attack. We've seen brutality and madness. And many Jewish parents are understandably concerned literally just about the safety of their kids. But the first thing I would say to my Jewish students about the current moment and in general is never adopt the psychology of the victim. Never. That is the pathway to nowhere good. Don't try to become another color in the intersectionality rainbow, you know, looking for Mama University to protect you. That is a perverse psychology. The Jews are the carriers of a great and exceptional civilization. Israel is one of the most heroic, modern, political, and civilizational stories of all time. What we need to impart in young Jews is the moral, intellectual, and civilizational confidence to stand up for their own people, their own tradition, their own faith. And then we have to look at these institutions and say, can we flourish here, or are these places not worthy of Jewish excellence anymore? And I think the, the reason the Jew is the so-called canary in the coal mine is that Jews at their best embody three things that the universities are hostile to. One are Hebraic values, meaning biblical values, the ideals of the family and of holiness and of justice, the Ten Commandments, the book of Leviticus. These are Hebraic inheritances that are the very antithesis of the woke ethos. Hebraism is the opposite of wokeism. And so the Jew represents that. The second is that Jews have long been the symbol, as we talked about, of meritocracy. Jews in a fair system in America have done very well. You know, if, if everybody just got in based on SATs, Jews would do just fine. So we have to change the rules of the game. And so Jews are the enemy of meritocracy. And then third, Israel is now the symbol of nationalism. Now, it should be the symbol of a noble nationalism, a, a, a desert brought back to life, a marriage of the spirit of antiquity and the spirit of startup nation, that's a pretty amazing achievement. All, by the way, in a small piece of land where the Jews have no desire to convert the world, but maybe to teach the world. And the, and the university ethos doesn't like it. So we're the symbol of biblical values, we're the symbol of meritocracy, and we're the symbol of noble nationalism. And therefore, the Jew has to be undone. And as go the Jews, so goes the West. The Jews will be fine. We've faced a lot of trials in history. It's the West that I worry about. <laughs> we'll now turn to the purpose of the university. Uh, it's very easy to critique a lot of the challenges that we find, or a lot of the issues that we find in the university that we don't particularly like. Uh, this can be sharpened when we understand the purpose of the university. So Pano, I'd like to begin with you what is the purpose of the university? And tell us a little bit about the University of Austin. Is it simply a Stanford or Princeton that is free from ideological capture, or is it a different vision altogether? Um, look, the purpose of the university is quite simple. It is the discovery of knowledge, the transmission of knowledge, and the preservation of knowledge. Universities are the places where human beings come together to learn about the world and learn about themselves in a collective environment. They're not the only places. The places of worship, there are other places where that happens, but university's primary purpose is this pursuit of truth, the pursuit of knowledge. Um, the University of Austin takes that as a foundational value. And to pursue knowledge, you have to be able to exchange ideas. You have to be able to look at the world with clarity, with honesty. So you need three foundational principles, three operating principles. You need a commitment to open inquiry. That is, we'll look at every question and try to judge it to the best of our abilities. You need a commitment to freedom of conscience. That is, that everybody who's part of this community can lead their own interior life with impunity. They can lead their life with dignity, no matter what their, their colleagues or fellow students or the institution believes. And the third is you have to be committed to civil discourse, the ability to speak to one another across differences in a productive manner. Civil discourse is not about two people who disagree expressing their opinion and not killing each other. Civil discourse is the discourse, the dialogue through which we build civil society. 
the way that we come together so that as we share opinions, we find better solutions. You know, one opinion plus another opinion doesn't equal two opinions, it should equal better opinions. So universities have to be committed to these foundational principles. Um, so our operating principles are those, but the foundational knowledge that allows you to have the right moral matrix, to see the world with moral clarity, is something that has to be taught. So we have, for the, very, for the first two years of, at the University of Austin, we have what we call the Intellectual Foundations Program. All students follow the same curriculum across two years, and it looks with you know, significant depth at you know, the origin of ideas, at politics, philosophy, literature, the sciences, uh, quantitative thinking, and asks, what are the human questions that we've been asking together over the millennia? And what are some of the most compelling answers to those questions? When you steep young people in this kind of thinking and you expose them to this kind of knowledge, this kind of experience, you create a moral and intellectual maturity that allows them to then go on to be productive citizens who seek the common good, who are able to stand up for what's right as individuals in a society. When you deny them these intellectual foundations, you set young people out in the world as untethered free agents who are vulnerable to every bad idea that comes along. You do them no service as students if you don't give them a bulwark against radical ignorance. Look, I, I think Pano just said is beautifully articulated, and I'm in sympathy with it, but to the extent that I have a modest, I don't even want to say disagreement, but different meaning, it's a little more Moses and a little less Mill. By which I mean, your vision is very much the free and open marketplace of ideas. Um, and through that conversation, where everyone can enter into it, you know, with whatever starting point they want and whatever ending point they want, as long as they are allowed to seek the truth in earnest, um, that that spirit of the individual pursuit flourishes. And I think that's very elevated and certainly much better than the alternatives that we have in most universities today, which are kind of secularist religions. But I also think you can make a strong case that part of the purpose of the university is to pass down a way of life. It is to perpetuate a way of being in the world. Um, and it is to prepare the leaders who are going to be the carriers of those traditions. And I, I think, you know, when, when, when you were first thinking about the University of Austin, I made the case, well, you should found the great federalist university. By which I mean, have a series of communities that live under the umbrella of the University of Austin, but that have strong commitments um, of faith and identity. And then you have an elevated form of pluralism, but you have a form of pluralism that honors the fact that the colleges within that university are in the perpetuation and formation business, more perhaps than simply in the pursuit business. I, and this yeah. is a tension that yeah. runs to the heart of America. I mean, it runs to the heart of what Tocqueville understood. You know, um, America's done pretty well in balancing being a, a, a people of faith and a people of progress, a people that honors the past and a people that builds the future, and we have to do both. And the sword of free speech is an important sword in the face of the cancel culture of the modern universities. But I don't think we should worship ultimately at the altar of free speech. And yeah. I think the, the noblest purpose of the university, I think, is to perpetuate an elevated way of life. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I re remember our conversations about a federalist model, and I welcome it. I'm waiting for you to come start Tikva College uh, as part of University of Austin. You might not have to wait too long. Um, Look, here, here's what I would say just to, to respond to that. A university, a, a modern secular university in a modern secular democratic polity has to be intellectually pluralistic, all right? Has to be big tent and include people from all different backgrounds who themselves, singly or collectively, can pursue truths more intensively, you know? So the idea that there could be colleges that represent you know, Jewish traditions or Christian traditions or other sorts of traditions, but that also played a life in the collective life of the college. It took the intellectual foundations program and that learned how to be an engineer. To me, that's a beautiful model of pluralism. Um, I just don't think, because I've seen the danger of this happening, I don't think 
institutions should ultimately get to determine what is true or not. They have to be a forum for the pursuit of truth. Because as soon as institutions have that power, they will abuse that power. So it is a, it's a balancing act. It really is. So, but like I said, I, I welcome that vision, actually. Parallel to this conversation, Joe, there are some out there, many parents, that may not voice publicly but uh, will quietly wonder, this all sounds lovely, but I need my son or daughter to get a good job when they graduate especially at the price point. How would you advise parents that are thinking along those lines about both the purpose of the university and, and specifically University of Austin, which is new, uh, it's just embarking, does not yet have that signal? Well, so we have a talent network around this university of uh, well over 100, I think maybe almost 200 now, of our friends who've started big companies, who've helped, who've helped build a lot of the most important innovative things in our country. Uh, who've agreed to help the students to partner with them, who are eager to hire them. I have some friends saying they want to hire 10 per class. That's not going to work out when there's only, only 100 people coming out. But, uh, <laughs> but we have a lot of friends who are desperate for, for the, the best and brightest who have these foundations, who have these views. And so you know, I, I, this, this is not going to be an easy university to get into. We're doing scholarships for all the first 100. This is going to be some of the very best and brightest in the US. Uh, the people who are going to get into this are going to be ones who, in general, are already going to be set up to be very successful, so I'm not really worried for the success of our kids. I know the parents, it's their job to worry about that, but we have a lot of the best who, who are specifically eager to work with and help them. But the th other thing I'll say is, you know, it goes a little bit to the tension of what we were just talking about here. It, I, you know, it really is important to me to have people who are coming out of this university who are shaped with the courage to boldly confront things, to say, this is broken, to not worry about uh, the fact that the, the calling something out is gonna gonna be a microaggression, right? I think it's, it's, it's basically it's the opposite. Like people get stronger because they're challenged. People, you know, you, it, it's, it's this whole thing at the universities where you're protecting people and, and, and making them intellectually weak is the opposite of what you want to do. You want people who are strong, who confront problems, who discuss them openly, who work together to quickly solve them. That's a culture where you know you had you had a very small number of people go into our big tech companies and kind of shift them in this very very dangerous kind of kind of very broken progressive way. You know, and, and I think even similarly, if you can have people come out who are bold, who are smart, who confront things, who don't put up with nonsense, even the small number coming out of the University of Austin, going into the innovation world, going into the halls of our government, could actually shift that in a very positive, very bold, very strong way. So for, for me, the mission here, it, it is very much passing on a certain way of, of looking at the world and thinking in the sense that the way I want them to look at the world is to boldly confront things and be courageous and, and, and be leaders when they come out, because we need more of that. Just on this point, I think one of the sad effects of the current university model is it's, it's beat courage out of young people. Yes. Meaning they're, they're, in their rational calculation, they have to keep their head down, not voice an opinion that might be offensive or independent, play the game so they can get into college and then get into law school and then get into the law firm and then get into this. And, th and then they wake up and they're 70, and who are they? And, and that's a real tragedy. And I think one of the actual salient benefits, if one could put it that, of this last month of madness is that a lot of students have finally said, I'm not going to be in fear anymore, meaning that, the, that I'm going to actually stand up for my values and my ideals. Okay. Because entrepreneurs need to be able to take risk. They need to have independence of mind. They need to be bold. And the current system is an antidote to that. And, and so things that are like the University of Austin, other new foundings, I think will invite the most entrepreneurial spirits. And, and it's not just our students. Let's be honest. A lot of adults in our society are, uh, have been taught to shut up and virtue signal and go along. You know who the most cowardly men and women in our society are in, in, the, in the innovation sector? It's the people running these funds, people running the venture funds, running the hedge funds. All of them have been taught by all of the people who back them at our NGOs that you better just say, only politically correct woke things. If you speak up about one thing, you might get canceled. You might not be able to raise any more money from these people. I've had these people reach out to me constantly, threatening me, saying, Joe, we, we, you know, we advise a 1,000 university endowments, and I see multiple of them are investors with you. It's really important to us that you signal your, that you're pro-DEI and you're pro these other things. And I say, no, actually, these things are wrong. They're an illiberal philosophy. And they're shocked because no one says this because our whole society has been taught to be a cowardly wimp and go along with something that's wrong. And, and we, we have to break that if we're going to save our civilization. So let's now turn toward renewal. And I think the disposition of this panel is to build and to build new great things. 
But before we actually do so, my question is, is there any hope for reform? If you look just at the IVs, they collectively have $182 billion in their endowments. They have history of producing excellent scholars, students that have gone on to achieve great things. Uh, they have rich alumni networks that are very supportive of students coming out. Before we move on, is there any hope, is there any reason to believe that reform might be possible? Yes and no. Uh, reform amongst the elite institutions, I'm highly skeptical. The, to, to reform, you have to be made radically uncomfortable. And they are so well endowed. They're so capable of weathering the storms, even of donors who, who are pulling away, um, that exerting the kind of pressure on them that's necessary to really change institutions, I think, is, is very unlikely. I do think there are schools at sort of, you know, layers below those, you know, the most elite schools, where um, there is hope. I mean, I meet regularly now with college presidents across the country, and they are all pulling for the University of Austin. I had a call not so long ago with the president of a prestigious liberal arts school in the Midwest who said, Pano, like you, you guys have to succeed. He goes, my board of trustees talks more about your school than my school. And the things you're doing are really putting pressure on us to think about who we are and what we stand for. And I think there are a lot of serious people on boards, uh, leaders of schools, students, who um, individually are, are desirous of reform. But reform will not happen until institutions stand up to lead the way. We have to show them what reform looks like by renewing higher education. And so I don't believe we can reform anything from within until we build new institutions from outside and we show them what education really should be and can be. I, I think that's well said. I, I just wanna make sure people understand there's a lot of people who just started to be aware of, oh, wow, this president, this university said the wrong thing, this department said the wrong thing. Let's go replace a few of these people. Maybe we could fix it. And it's, that's, it's extraordinarily naive. These places, like on average, the top 50 schools have tripled the size of their administration over the last 20 years. If you look at, there's, there's more administrators at Yale than there are students. There's almost as many administrators, about 15,000 as there are students at Harvard. And these administrations, based on multiple studies, are to the extreme left, even of the professors. So these people have... And then every single one of the departments at these schools, the way they're set up, they get to appoint their own professors. There are more illiberal kind of neo-Marxist kind of fighters for that side than there are moderates in the vast majority of the humanities departments. I'm not saying there's more than there are Republicans. There's more than there are moderates. Like we've completely lost the war here. So it's very easy for them, for a lot of naive people, it's a virtue signal. You're gonna put in a new president. You're gonna say the right things. You're gonna have stupid donors who are not on campus, not close enough, who might start giving some money because they heard the right thing. But then boom, it's definitely gonna be back to where it was because it still is the core rotten. And so no, I, I don't think you're gonna fix these very well endowed schools. I totally agree with Pano though. We can set an example and we can help kind of lead a bunch of other ones in the right direction. Look, I broadly agree with that analysis, certainly about the kind of prestige private universities. I don't, th I, and I think it's incredibly noble and courageous what some donors in the last few weeks have done to say enough, I'm not funding you anymore, I'm not on your board anymore, I'm not putting up with this anymore. Um, I hope they'll channel those resources to building new institutions um, because I think the barriers to reforming these places are just too great. The, the only place where I would have some modest degree of hope, actually, are large state universities in conservative states. I mean, if you see what is happening in Florida, it's very encouraging. You know, Ben Sass has been a, a voice of moral and intellectual clarity and courage. University of Florida is a major serious institution. If he can build oases of excellence there and then start to move the culture, that'll have a big effect. And and at some point, state legislatures and governors are going to wake up and say, well, we don't have to only complain about this. We actually have power, and we can say, no, we're not going to do this in our state. How does it make sense to have major state universities funded by the taxpayers of those states whose entire purpose is to undermine the value systems of those states? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And I think what they're finally realizing is they shouldn't be judged by you know the standards of US News and World Report. They should be judged by the standards of their own 
civilizational compass, their own ideals of excellence, their own ideals of a good state and a good polity. And if they do that, they might be able to actually turn some of those institutions. And that would be a very, very healthy development. And I think not an implausible. Joe, you've built many companies. You've built many things. What is needed to build, both in terms of launching a new university, walk me through the external factors and resources that are required, but then also the mindset of the builder itself? Well, I'll go to the mindset of the builder, and we'll have Pano walk you through all the things required, because we've been working on this for a while, and he knows some of those details better than me. But listen, when you're, when you're starting something new, I mean, what, what you look for as, as, an on, as a venture capitalist or entrepreneur, there's really kind of two high-level things. One is, what's the gap in the world? Where, where is the world now versus where it could be? And you want to build in places where there's a big gap. There is obviously a huge gap here. We don't even have a single elite university with the right values, with the right setup, inspiring you know, our children, making them stronger in the right way. So, so I think we all can agree there's a giant gap here. And then the other thing you need is you need the best talent in the world. If you want to if you be very successful, you take the best talent in the world with a healthy culture, uh, with a culture that's based on the cultures of other successful things we've built, something that iterates quickly, something that attracts other smart people, something where people feel a sense of ownership, uh, so, you know, so there's all, all sorts of these values that kind of are inherent to the best companies we build, and, and you gotta attract those people and align them, and, and you gotta point them at it and go. And you know, and, and for a university, there's other things you have to do as well. Of course, you actually had to like you know do 2,000 pages of paperwork, for example, to be approved to be called a university, which we achieved apparently as of last week. And and and, and, there, and there's and, there, and there's different cultures. I mean, I've built a lot of things. Listen, engineers, the smartest engineers in the world. They are complicated to work with. They're effectively artists. We have to manage artists at our engineering companies, uh, and it's it's very very difficult. Um, it, they seem slightly easier than academics. <laughs> so so I'll, I'll switch over to Pano for some of the unique requirements for building a university. Joe Joe is not exaggerating about two thousand pages of paperwork. One of the problems we have in higher education is the there's no space for innovation for new institutions because the process of starting new universities is so cumbersome. Um, the, you know, the, the, uh, I'm going to use a word I probably shouldn't since you told me we're live, but I will. There's a cartel that, that is assembled to keep new universities from beginning. It, let me just m put it this way. We are the first new private university to be established in the state of Texas since 1963. Okay. Think about how much Texas has grown in 60 years, I and mean, the demand for new institutions there, the barriers to entry are so high. You need to fight a bureaucracy that's gonna push back at every stage. You need tremendous resources. You need the right you know, assemblage of talent. You need a vision that you're gonna stick with, even though you know, along the way you're gonna, you're gonna be facing obstacles one after the other. And most importantly, what we need that we cannot provide is we need partners. We need students and parents to believe in the vision. We need supporters from the outside to come in and, and contribute. The only way that we can build something like this, especially at this moment in time, is in collaboration. So one of the great challenges in building a university from scratch is communicating the urgency of the vision. And I have to say, um, the times we live in are making it much easier to communicate that urgency. As I said, we started this two years ago, and we were told by everybody, every consultant, every person in higher education, that there's no way you're gonna start a university for at least 10 years. We said, we're gonna have freshmen in three years. And we are now on track to have our first freshman class three years after the day that we announced the original university. All right, it takes a kind of commitment and a kind of um, just a buy-in and a tenacity, and it takes a lot of people who commit to that. So that, for me, has been one of the most rewarding things about this whole process. Is it's not Joe and I, you know, not the two of us. It's 1,000 people, it's 5,000 people. It's the students, I'll, I'll quickly share, this morning, we went public, we went live, and we announced to the world that we're opening application process for the first class at University of Austin. We announced this at 9.30 a.m. Central Time. We received our first application at 9.31 a.m. Central Time. And there has been a continuous stream 
of applications throughout the day. In fact, we already have more applications than spots at the University of Austin, and we haven't even closed out our first day. So that is heartening to me. That means that there is a, you know, an entire galaxy of fellow travelers out there who are willing to commit to a new version, a new vision of higher education, and they're willing to, and this is the most important thing, to bring their own daughters and sons to this institution. To me, that is an amazing, amazing thing to see happen. Eric, is there a unique role for the Jews to play in renewal? Or asked differently, how can Jews uniquely contribute to renewal in this space? Well, I think there's a unique role and a unique challenge uh, for the Jews. I think in the deepest sense, I think the, the Jews have a unique role in the Hebraic renewal of America. Meaning, I think what we need more than ever are Hebraic remedies for some of our modern disorders. Uh, there's a reason it's, you know, a passage from the Hebrew Bible on the Liberty Bell. Well, we need to proclaim liberty again, and we need to proclaim civilization again. And I think the Jews have a kind of energy married to depth that can help the American story. Uh, and we need to use that talent in an arena where we've always cared and where we've always flourished, which is education. So do I think the Jews have a unique role? Absolutely. I think this is also a unique moment for the Jews themselves, because I think Jewish parents are now more than ever open to alternatives. You know, the greatest builder in modern Jewish history, and arguably one of the great builders in modern history period, was Herzl. And when he first wrote his book uh, in the late 1800s, envisioning the founding of a Jewish state, the establishment thought he was crazy. He tried to say that the Jews don't have a future in Europe. It's broken. It's an illusion of acceptance. And we need to build our own place. We need to build our own nation. And, and the big money of the day and the established leaders of the day mostly thought he was nuts. But he was actually right. Uh, and his prophecy came true. It didn't come true on its own. It came true through a lot of difficult work and on the other side of great tragedy. But it came true. So this is for the Jews a kind of Herzlian moment. And I think what we have to do is two things at once. On the one hand, we have to help strengthen and embolden the students that are on these campuses today. We need to connect them to each other. We need to arm them with arguments. We need to give them the moral and Jewish courage that they need to stand up for themselves and for their values in these broken institutions that it's too late to leave. So for the 20-year-olds, we have to help them. But for the 15-year-olds, we have to be ready with something better. And what I can envision is a future where there's a network of institutions like the University of Florida, like Hillsdale, like the University of Austin, like Yeshiva, like Shalem in, in Israel, and other places that actually embrace the idea that not only do we want Jews, we want Jewish ideas in our institutions. And I think Tikva, which is working with thousands of high school students, can help be the bridge between these seeking parents and these seeking students in a new set of excellent institutions where Jews are welcomed, celebrated, and that those institutions are not only good for the Jews, they're good for America. So I think in the next few months, we're going to see a serious conversation about how to create new alternative strategies. And I'll just tell you, we work with, I don't know, 50, 60 of the top Jewish day schools around the country. And those heads of schools are begging us to create alternatives for their students. They want something different. And I think it will be a family of institutions that offer something better. I'll ask one final question to each one of our panelists. Uh, for Joe and Pano, you're speaking both to uh, an audience here, uh, but also this will be broadcast live of many Jewish parents. To those that are trying to navigate this college application process, what arguments would you make for why the University of Austin is a compelling and good fit for their Jewish children. You know, I, I, I strongly agree with what Eric said. And, you know, any, we're, we're, we're at a time where our people, I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, it's been a very stressful, very difficult month for me. It's just been, been horrible seeing what's happened. And e even as much as I understood how much some of these places were broken, it's still just, just shocking, right, to, 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 to see to see people, you know, calling for, the, calling for you know, murder or destruction and just to see, to see them just like, full of hate for our people. And there's just, it's just, it's, it, it is shocking. It's very difficult for me to go online. I spend time online on these things. And it just, it's, it's, it's been a very hard month. And I think all of us are kind of wondering like, who we are as Jews and our places in the world and what to do. And if higher education 
is going to reflect what our civilization wants it to reflect, if it's going to reflect a meritocracy, if it's going to reflect the best and the brightest seeking truth, if it's going to be part of a positive vision of the future, that's going to include uh, a lot of Jews at our top institutions, because you know, just, just based on our history and who we are and what we're capable of. And so, you, you know, I think, it's, I think it's, basically, it's basically irresponsible at this point as a Jewish person to be setting your kids and supporting these things that are broken. And you know, University of Austin, it's a meritocratic institution. It's an institution that is being shaped by a lot of the greatest innovators of our times. And you know, we've raised about $200 million so far for this. And I'll tell you what, I, I think a very large amount of that actually is from Jews. This is, it's not a Jewish institution, but it's an institution being built and shaped in large part by Jews based on the future we want to see. And, and very much with the values of Jikun Olam you know, kind of built into what we're doing here. That is the core of this. We are trying to fix the world. And you know, we'd love to partner with other Jews in doing that. And I would say, it, you know, our particular mission, particular ethos of the institution is not just to build an institution, but to build an institution that prepares young people to be builders of institutions, to be creators, to be innovators, to be entrepreneurs. And to do that, you know, you have to, you have to draw in, as Joe said, that top talent, that you have to be meritocratic, we have to smart kids and all that. But we also have to shape young people and give them a moral compass, okay? To be able to go out there in the world and, and achieve great things is one thing. To go out there in the world and be able to achieve things that are good and great is another thing. So when we think about the students that we're attracting and what we're going to do with them, we often say, we're going to take those top students. We're also looking for students who have characteristics of grace of grit and of gratitude. Grace, because if we're going to be in an environment where, where, where we have the free and open exchange of ideas and, and we're going to push ourselves really hard and we're going, to, you know, we're going to have conversations that are challenging, we have to treat one another with grace. I mean, that is sadly lacking. I mean, cancel culture is the absence of grace. We have to treat one another with grace and be gracious. Grit, because universities should be hard. If they're going to prepare you to do great things, they should be hard. And we need students who can stick with things and get through things. We need to foster that grit. And gratitude. Gratitude is the opposite of the sort of sense of privilege that many people, young people have at universities today. That they go to a prestigious university and they pay a high tuition, and therefore they're entitled to things that follow. If you are a young person in 21st century America, and you have the opportunity to go to a university, you are among the most privileged people who have ever lived on this planet. If you don't feel gratitude for that, you will not fully develop as a human being in that setting and you will not be capable of giving back to the world the gifts that you have been fostered. And Eric, to close us out, <clears throat> before we turn to audience Q&A, what role does Tikva have to play in bringing renewal to its full and greatest potential? Look, I think we're at a hinge moment in history. And, and once again, the Jews find themselves at the center of the story. The, the great Jewish intellectual decades ago, Milton Himmelfarb, joked that Jews are no bigger than a rounding error in the Chinese census. And yet we always seem to find ourselves at the center of world events. Well, we're at the center of the world story and that it's little Israel that's the fighting front lines in the battle of civilization versus barbarism. Um, and that has the will to act in the face of these terrible enemies. And it's the Jews on campuses that are at the center of an argument about whether civility <laughs> um, and the elevated pursuit of the truth and the good, the true, the good, and the beautiful has a home still in America. So I think what Tikva can do is we've become an important educational institution that is working with thousands of young people. And we've tried to invite them into the majesty of their own inheritance and their own heritage, the richness of Jewish ideas, of the Zionist story, of the Jewish contribution to America. And what we've realized over time is that we have to reach them younger and younger. And that's why we're so focused on building K-12 institutions that bring our Jewish classical vision to life. 
But we also have to offer them a real menu of alternatives in the arena of higher education. And so whether TICFA itself will build a college and, and join the, the, the alliance of sane and elevated institutions like the University of Austin, or whether we'll help try to build a network of in existing institutions that want to do it, I don't know yet. But over the next couple months, this is something that we're going to think hard about. Because what I know is that we have thousands of parents, young people, looking to us saying, where can we go where Jewish excellence matters? That's what we have to stand for. We have to stand for Jewish excellence, and we have to build institutions worthy of it. I, I'm excited about the University of Austin of, as being one of those and one that will help break the barrier. I think there'll be 20 others if you guys succeed. And by the way, I think that's part of why you did it. That's the goal. A and, and I think the Jews can help be builders in this Herzlian moment. That's what I think Tikva has to contribute. Thank you. So I'm now going to open it up for a little bit of audience Q&A. Do you have a question? Enlightening, and thank you for the discussion. It's beautiful listening to you and articulating um, noble ideas. My, my dad has a PhD in education, and I, I wish he was here just to kind of, um, uh, he, I was, I'm Israeli, he was brought up in Israel, moved here recently, so really appreciate all the thoughts. Um, Joe, you mentioned you raised uh, north of $200 million and kind of, it sounds of a, like a lot, but thinking about you know the sheikhs in, in Saudi Arabia being able to write a two billion dollar check into any endowment of these elite universities, ha, it sounds like a drop in the water. How, how do you? I mean, if you want to build something that flourishes and real, you need to think even bigger. So how do you, how do you get there? Yeah, well, you know, it does take more capital. We need more support. It's not going to take billions of dollars to get to somewhere really good right now. So I, I think I think we're at a point where you know because we're going to have a much smaller administration, we don't need fifteen thousand like activist administrators, you know, we, we, we might, might need 100 of them, you know, and, and even then we're planning on outsourcing some of that to, there's a free market university we're, we're working with in Central America, we're really smart about how do you lower the costs and make it efficient, and, you, you know, so we, we still will have tuition that will cover a lot of it. I think we're going to get to a point with a steady state where we'll have, you know, hundreds of students a year that pay for it, and hopefully then grow that to over, over a thousand, the same size as the other top schools, and, you know, I, I think, I think for, with a few hundred million more, we're going to hit, hit our goals, and then obviously if you can raise more than that, you could start new schools, new research groups, new other things on top of it. But you know, I, I, th I think I think we're well on our way to having to something where we're in a really good spot. And now, if we can d double that again, I think we're then in a really good spot. I don't know, Pano, if you have. Other yeah, I, I totally agree. Look, our, we we calculated before starting this that we needed two hundred million dollars to launch a university, and here we are launching a university with two hundred million dollars. Who knew? <laughs> and and uh, and we're gonna we're gonna raise more, and we're gonna grow, and we're gonna expand. But part of it is creating a financial model that um, is not dependent upon the, the, the massive endowments, but that is entrepreneurial and creates other, other revenue streams and keeps the cost of administrative down, keeps the cost of tuition down. Because the primary thing that a university is in stand for is what happens in the classroom. We don't need sushi bars, right? We don't need climbing walls. All right, we need really bright kids and really talented professors and a, you know, this really, you know, fantastic new handheld technology called books. <laughs> and it's pretty simple. That, so, yeah. Uh, that said, I would love a beautiful campus. It's inspiring to people and we're, we'll hopefully get that. <laughs> <laughs> like climbing walls. First, thank you all very much. It's great what you're doing. You're cutting off the point from, the, from where we are now to the future, but what do we do about the kids who have graduated in the last five, 10 years, or the lost generation that we're now having to deal with? Have you given any thought to how we turn that and make that more productive and less cancel going forward? Well, I spent a lot of time doing that in my company, so you have to re-educate some of these kids if you want to make them useful. Uh, how you do it in a societal level, I think it's a very good question. I, I haven't worked on it. I don't know if Tikva's thinking about that at all. I mean, look, one of the, I, I don't want to call it quite a silver lining, but when you have to be a young person operating within the current universities, um, if you're lucky enough to find a couple of decent teachers and have a little bit of courage, you do acquire certain skills um, of articulating your views, being courageous under fire, being in the sort of minority, the noble minority. And so, uh, you know, 
let's not write off an entire generation here. Uh, there are some exceptional young people. Just today, two of our students are in the op-ed page of the Wall Street Journal writing about what's going on, you know, meaning Tikva's been able to seed a lot of very impressive young professionals and then connect them to each other. Um, but there's no question that the culture of the universities and the overall culture uh, of the society has done a number on the worldview and the soul and, and the, you know, cultural and political orientation of, of people in their 20s today. Um, and it's extended adolescence in ways that are very unhealthy. And I think we need to renew not only the culture of truth and beauty, but also the culture of the family um, and, and encourage young people to take seriously, you know, what it means to build a home as well as to build a society. And, and, and that's, that's another important part of the, of the work ahead. So universities are a crucial part of that, but there are other institutions of civil society that also have to be strengthened. Um, that was just inspiring. Joe, Pano, Eric, thank you so much. I have no doubt that the University of Austin is going to be a big success. And I think being a big success, you're going to generate more of these. And I think this is, this is what we need. This is absolutely what we need. But I was taken, Eric, by your uh, recommendation in the short term that we find a way to, in these red states, to begin to think as Florida has with the University of Florida about ways in which we can make progress. Because there, aren't gonna, there are only going to be so many kids who get into the University of Austin in the short term. And I guess it, I think it would be incredibly helpful to have the thinking of the three of you and maybe others on what a conversation with Governor Abbott would look like and other governors in these red states. Because while I think that is the next step, it's certainly not going to be easy for him. Um, uh, however much he may want to do it, uh, the governor of Florida wanted to do it, but it's not, a, it's not an easy thing, and there's going to be a tremendous amount of pushback. And I guess I'd like to hear from you uh, just briefly on what that conversation looks like. What do we say to a, to a Governor Abbott about what he ought to do and how he ought to do it so that there are some short-term steps in the larger universities that give real options to people in the next three, five, seven years? Look, it's, it's a great question. I, I, I would say three things. First, these governors and these state legislators have to believe they can do it. They have to just simply have a, a, a worldview that we ought to have great universities in our state that reflect, advance, and perpetuate our values. That's like at a first principles level. Tactically, I'd say you got to do two things if I were advising them. You're not going to transform the University of Florida overnight. You have to do it strategically. And so what you've got to create are significant oases of academic excellence. So what SAS has done in Florida is they've created something called the Hamilton Center. And this is going to be a bastion of, of they've actually stole William, William Inboden to be the director of it from the University of Texas, a great uh, strategist and humanist. Um, and they're going to create this center of excellence that they will grow over time. And they'll, they will create an independent school within the university where they can appoint the professors, grow the institution, attract students. While, by the way, many of the departments that have the most perverse ideology are not the most popular. They're being propped up with low enrollments. And so if you build oases of excellence with these institutions, over time, they'll grow and the other things can shrink. I think the other thing that, that these uh, you know, it, you can do at the state level, and DeSantis has done this, is that there are smaller public institutions that are easier to take over and change. And so there's a small college in Florida where DeSantis has put a lot of very impressive people on the board, and they're just changing it. They're just saying, no, we're going to have this core curriculum, and we're going to do this, and we're going to stand for these values, and I think they're going to be successful. And so... I think if you have the will to act, then you have to find the opportunities. And, and you can't be anemic, but you can't be, you know, you're not going to transform these things in a year. But over a decade, over time, they could make a very big change. And, I, and I'll, I'll just say, so my, the two things I'm working on in this area is one is University of Austin and one is my policy group, the Cicero Institute. And we have teams in 15 states and we, we are working on a lot of legislation. We're getting passed to, to stop some of these things. And so, you know, first of all, 
the majority of these state schools now have what are called uh, like basically DEI statements. You basically have to sign on that you're ideologically aligned with the far left in order to even be considered for the jobs. And you have to have the statements you write ahead of time. And so, you know, we're banning these. We're getting, we're getting multiple states to pass laws saying that's illegal. You can't do that in our schools. And, you know, I, I you know, right, my friend uh, and mentor Gordon Gee, who's at the University of West Virginia, you know, he's, they, they have some budget issues right now and he's going through and they're getting rid of departments they don't need because there's low enrollment and frankly because they've been conquered by crazy people and they're, and they're getting rid of them right now. So I, so I totally agree, we have to go in, we have to work on the smaller schools first, we have to change the rules. You know, another problem right now is there's not enough PhDs that have the right values. This is a huge challenge for us to do this and you know what's happened is if you wanna get a PhD in history in the United States of America, the top 100 colleges, you have to signal that you hate markets and that you're some form of Marxist and you're some form of God knows what intersectional nonsense. And, and that's the only way you can even get a PhD in history anymore. So, so we are short, short of young professors these places. So we're going to have to graduate more PhDs uh, who are not insane from these universities that we kind of get presences in. And we, we got to build from there. So this is a multi-year, it's really a few decade project, but it can be done. Just one other point I'd add. I think there needs to be much more practitioner educators within the universities than there are today. Meaning I think young people learn from models of excellence to emulate. And if you want to be great in business or in world affairs or in you know, a variety of fields, being around impressive people that have achieved things in those fields is how you learn. And so yes, we need great professors of history, but I think creative universities should be much more open to leveraging all kinds of talent yep. that can mentor young people and really put before them is like models of excellence. Like that's the best way I know how to describe and that, it. And that's why we're trying to include some more great innovators to, to, with our students and expose them to it. I totally agree, it's really key. I just wanna to add to an earlier question about the impact of new institutions on existing institutions. Um, at University of Florida, they're starting the Hamilton Center. As you said, Will Inbud and is there designing the curriculum. Who is he turned to to help design the curriculum at the University of Florida? Us because they look at what we're doing at University of Austin and they want to build something that's, that is, you know, that resonates with the kind of curriculum that we've built. So by starting new things and providing models and examples, the models might multiply outside institutions, but they do also help for reforming institutions from within. Well, guys, thank you very much. I know we ran a little bit long. I'd like to conclude with uh, a spirit of gratitude. First to Joe and Taylor for hosting us here tonight we read uh, last week in the Parsha. <laughs> we read in Parsha Vayera about the importance of hospitality, and you two are exemplars of that, and so very grateful for you convening us tonight. I also want to thank Joe and Pano for audacity, for putting forward a bold vision that many people thought was crazy, and marching through the gauntlet and bringing it to the point where applications open today. That is refreshing, it's inspiring. <laughs> Thank you to Eric for always asking the most important questions, even when they're difficult to answer, especially when they're difficult to answer, and thereby equipping the Jews to proceed with a little bit more wisdom and a little bit more courage. And lastly, I want to thank Caroline Brick, the executive director of the Jewish Parents Forum, our fearless leader, who's the mastermind behind this event uh, and the growth of JPF. She's been convening Jewish parents to really wrestle with some of these questions, uh, and this is only the beginning. If you enjoyed tonight, I hope you will tune back in on December 6th in New York City. We're going to do a live event with Jonathan Haidt called The Great Rewiring, in which we explore how technology has transformed adolescence in American life. Uh, we're partnering with 39, maybe 40 Jewish schools around the country. And our hope is that this becomes a tipping point for when Jewish schools adopt policies that actually help kids flourish in life. And so, Caroline, thank you for convening us here. <laughs> And I'll conclude with this. Um, Rabbi Tarfon once said that uh, the day is long and the master is demanding. And while you may not finish the work, neither are you free to desist from it. And so thank you to our panelists for embarking on something bold uh, and taking what we think is probably one of the most important issues that we need to wrestle with today. Unclear where we ultimately end up, I have great hope. Tikva, obviously, in Hebrew is hope uh, for where we'll land. But Wherever we land, you guys jumped in and uh, you're doing the hard work. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Have a good night.